I mean, the, the name of the sermon is why do men struggle with God? <laughs> so we're going to end up back at almost the same location where we left. Where Jesus again has a profound, I mean, where Jacob again has a profound encounter with God. When we left him, he was uh, laying at Bethel, and he was, uh, ha and he had this dream. And the dream, in the dream, he sees a golden staircase and angels going up to heaven and angels coming down and he sees uh, and then God comes to him in a voice and he says I will bless you in the same way that I blessed your father Abraham and your father Isaac and that you will be the father of many nations and Jacob truly is because he becomes the father of the twelve tribes of Israel. But, and Jacob wakes up and he realizes that all of this time that he has spent in his life seeking his father's blessing and his brother's birthright, that he didn't need those things. That God is the one that he needed to bless him. And that it was God's blessing that made him who he was in the world. And it made him the father of great nations, of the great nation of Israel. And it is even Jacob that the name of Israel comes from. Because today we learn that God changes Jacob's name from Jacob to Israel. He's no longer the hill grabber, but the man of the father of many nations. But the thing that we have to understand is even this encounter with God does not change Jacob very much. Even though he now knows that he has God's blessing. He still continues to live in the world like he always had. He still continues to run from Esau. And in fact, if you can see the yellow line, but he runs from where he is, south of Jericho, all the way up here to the Euphrates River, and then he travels down the river until he gets to Laban's house, the man who was to be his father-in-law. He's still running from Esau. He doesn't believe that God has what it takes to give him what he needs to survive. He's still afraid of his sins. And I thought, how often we're like that. That even when we encounter God and we have a profound relationship with him, and even when we've given our life to God through Jesus Christ, we often continue to run. And we continue to have moments and periods of our lives where we stand in separation from God, from God because we're afraid. We're afraid of the consequences of our own sin, or we're afraid of the wrath that we've incurred from other people. And sometimes we don't change the way we live a whole lot. I mean, we have a knowledge that we haven't had in the past. We know God. We know that He's our Savior. You know, we know that our blessings come from Him. And so that changes us somewhat. But like Jacob, sometimes it doesn't change us enough. Jacob goes on to pat around, and right away he falls in love with the beautiful Rachel, and he wants to marry her. And he meets her father, and it isn't long before he makes a, an offer to, uh, to marry his daughter Rachel. And 
Levon makes a deal with him. He says, hey, if you'll tend my sheep for seven years as my shepherd boy, then I will let you marry my daughter. And his commitment is strong enough that he does that. His love for Rachel is that strong. But unfortunately, the mother's son meets the mother's people. And they're all tricksters. They're all connivers. And so, Laban tricks Jacob on his wedding night. And he sends his other daughter, Leah, who Jacob does not love, to be the wife. And Jacob, probably drunk with wine, wakes up the next day and realizes that he is married to the wrong woman. And of course he has a breakdown and throws a fit. And Laban says, okay, you can marry Rachel, but you have to work for me for seven more years. So Laban becomes the man that Jacob has been. He begins to uh, connive and to cheat. Mm -hmm. And so Jacob then begins to resort to his own ways and he starts to connive and figure out how he can get all of the flocks uh, from Laban. And they make a deal and Laban says you can have all the spotted uh, sheep and goats. And of course, if you know anything about the goat and sheep industry, you want a hide that doesn't have any spots on it because it doesn't sell for as much money as the, as the hide that is purely white. But God blesses Jacob and he ends up with more offspring than Laban. And so eventually they, uh, and then Jacob's wives begin to give him trouble. And uh, jealous, they're jealous of each other. Leah's jealous of Rachel because uh, Jacob loves her more. And so God closes um, Rachel's womb and won't give him children through Rachel because he feels sorry for Leah. And Leah has three boys and Rachel still doesn't have any. And then Rachel gives her uh, lady-in-waiting as, as, as Jacob's to Jacob as a wife, and she has some children, and then uh, Leah does the same, and so he ends up with four wives, and then finally Rachel has her first child, which is Joseph, and uh, then the boys are jealous of each other, and it just goes on and on, and it's, it's not a happy home, it's not a good place to be. And so, uh, after a period of time, Jacob flees Laban. And so Jacob ends up in this situation where he's um, between a rock and a hard place. He's running from Laban in Padaram, and he's still hiding from Esau in the land of Canaan, and he's caught in between. And he's scared to death, and he doesn't know what to do, and he thinks they both want to kill him. And he's decided to go to Esau, probably because there's been more time between his conflicts with Esau than there has been with his conflicts with Laban. And so he's, uh, he's getting prepared to go and, and start a life over again with his wife and his children and his herds. He's now very wealthy in Esau's land, and uh, he sends some men ahead of him, and, and he gets word. He says, we went to your brother. The scripture says in Genesis 32, 6, he says, we went to your brother Esau, and now he is coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. So he's feeling doomed. You know, he just, he's given up. And so he, he sends his wives and his children and his hired men and everybody in his flock on ahead of him, and he stays behind. And a stranger comes to him in the middle of the night, and he uh, he, he senses that it's a spiritual uh, a, a spiritual encounter. 
And it says, That night Jacob got up and took his two wives and his two maidservants and his eleven sons and crossed the ford of Jebok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, so that his hip was wrenched, and he wrestled with the man as he wrestled with the man. The man said, Let me go, because it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me first. And the man asked him, What is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. Because you have struggled with God and with man and have overcome and Jacob said, Please tell me your names. But he replied, Why do you ask my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Penel, saying, It is because I saw God's face, God face to face, and yet my life was spared. So the, Jacob perceives that he has wrestled with God all night long, and that uh, he overcame him. And I thought, how often we're like that. We wrestle with God, and we wrestle with each other continually. And, uh, and God tells Jacob, your name shall be Israel, which means overcome. It means that Jacob has that unique quality, regardless of all of his faults, to overcome difficulty and disaster. He, um, he is able to do this. But how is Jacob able? How is he able to overcome these difficult situations? Well, obviously, he has a tenacity that most people don't have. In fact, if you look at most successful people in the world, it's not that they haven't experienced disaster and failure. It's that they don't quit. The famous Prime Minister of England, William um, Winston Churchill, said, whatever you do, don't give up. Don't quit. He told this to a group of boys at his preparatory school where he, was, uh, where he had attended school, and he almost flunked out. He barely got through the school with very low grades. He wasn't a good student at all. He wasn't successful in school. And he had to tell them that through all his formal education and all they had taught him, what the one thing that he had learned was never give up. So it doesn't matter how many times you fail or how difficult your journey is. Don't give up. Don't give up. Giving up is like giving up on God. It's like saying, I've lost my faith and God won't help me through the end of this journey. And the fact is, God will help you, help you, but you have to keep letting Him help you. He will walk through this journey of life with you and He will never leave you. But you have the option to leave Him. And if you choose to do that, that's like quitting. It's like quitting on God and saying, God, you just can't do it for me, so I'm going to give up. But God does, but God can do it for me. And I thought of how often we've been like that. We we can't find ourselves between uh, a rock and a hard place because of work or because of family. I went through many years of a difficult family strife between my uh, wife and my, uh, my, uh, my, my family, and they never got along. And it was very hard. And sometimes I was like Jacob. I was out there on the, in the wilderness all by myself, and I had no one to turn to but God. But eventually, but God sustained us. 
He sustained our marriage. He sustained the difficulty of life. And today we have two beautiful children that we're very grateful for. And yes, my biological family has really kind of moved on without me. Some of them have died off and some of them just don't care. But God hasn't left me. He's still with me. And I'm still blessed. And I'm still rejoicing in the Lord. Even though I lost so much, God blessed me. Because that's how God is. He doesn't need us. Even when we wrestle with Him and we refuse to do those things that He doesn't really want us to do, He still, He stays with us through the night. He holds on to us through the night. And He will not let us go. Jacob didn't let God go either. Sometimes we're in between our mistakes. We made a mistake with Laban and we've made a mistake with Esau. And we're in between those two places and there doesn't look like the end of hope. It certainly doesn't look like there's any hope when you're standing in the wilderness and there's nothing around you but barren ground and no opportunities. But God makes a place for opportunity. God gets us <coughs> through our brokenness. And so we have to figure out what our center is. What is our center? What's the steady constant in our life? that keeps us going. It's God. We have to keep God at our center. And as long as we're doing that, eventually we will prevail. We have to hold on to God and not let go of Him. No matter how rough the night is. No matter how difficult. And God fulfills His promise. So Jacob is called the place Penel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet He spared my life. God showed mercy. God showed blessing to Jacob. It's not a question of whether he deserved it, or whether he had earned it. It never is with God. He's not interested and checklist and in petty achievements. He's interested in the heart and the commitment to Him. And that's why God shows mercy even to the fallen man. Even to the broken man. God shows mercy. And God shows mercy to me. And God shows mercy to you. Take that with you wherever you go. And know that as a child of God, He will never leave you. May God add His blessing to the reading of His Word and the thoughts expressed on the Scripture. In the name of the Father.